Hello, I am Zheng Yu Wang, the president of the Committee of 100. I want to thank all of you for taking time this evening to join us for a timely and crucial discussion on preventing a devastating pandemic, the first of our new webinar series, US China 2050. Through collaborations with leading universities and think tanks, the series examines long-term challenges faced by the United States and China, while also striving to identify innovative solutions that will address these transnational challenges in the long term. Today's discussion on preventing a devastating pandemic is especially important given the devastating impact of COVID-19 in China, the United States, and the rest of the world. As we still face the lasting effects of the coronavirus, we must, must not pause. Rather, we should begin preparing in anticipation of a world in which pandemics come and go. It is our pleasure to host this exceptional panel discussion with public health and infectious disease experts from both China and the United States. We look forward to their sharing their indispensable insights on what they have learned from dealing with the COVID-19 that will help us prepare for and prevent a devastating pandemic. And what we can do in the next 30 years to improve pandemic preparedness and response and how studies in medicine and international health effectively serve the global community in the highly interconnected world in which we live today. Before we begin the discussion, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Adam Chang, the Associate Professor of Health Policy and Management at the College of Public Health at the University of Georgia and Associate at the China Research Center, our co-organizer of today's discussion. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you, Z. Thanks uh, for allowing the China Research Center, CRC, to be part of this effort. CRC is a non-profit, non-partisan organization promoting understanding of a greater China and considered key to US-China relations, the mutual understanding based on knowledge and open communication, such as this uh, collaboration with the Committee of 100 on the dialogue between public health leaders from the two countries today. In particular today, with millions passed away and billions being affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, many are asking, will this happen again? How can we prevent and respond to the next pandemic? What are the equity concerns? Let me introduce a distinguished panel of public health leaders from the US and China. They led in the fights against the past epidemics and this pandemic, making them one of the most authoritative group on this topic. I am truly honored to introduce them and my introduction will not be sufficient to reflect their contributions. Nonetheless, I will have a quick introduction of all five speakers and then ask for their remarks. Dr. Tom Frieden is former director of the US CDC and former commissioner of the New York City Health Department. Dr. Frieden is currently president and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives. His efforts as health commissioner in New York City increased life expectancy by three years. As CDC director, Dr. Frieden oversaw the uh, efforts that helped end the uh, 2014 West Africa Ebola epidemic. Dr. George Gao is Dean of the Medical School, University of Chinese Academy of Sciences and former director, Chinese CDC. Dr. Gao is a renowned public health leader and has pioneered numerous breakthroughs on the pathogenesis mechanisms and pathogen host interactions of emerging infectious pathogens, including flu, Ebola, MERS, Zika, and SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Dr. Jeffrey Copeland is former director and a 26 year veteran, US CDC, and former vice president for global health of Emory University, founder and former director of the Emory Global Health Institute. He has played a key role in many domestic 
and global public health issues, including smallpox, SARS, and HIV AIDS, and tobacco control. He was the founding director of the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, a co-founder and former president of the International Association of National Public Health Institutes. Dr. Guan Liu is Boya Distinguished Professor of Economics, Dean of the Institute for Global Health and Development, Director of the China Center for Health Economic Research, Peking University. He serves as co-organizer for the US-China Track 2 Dialogue on Health. He is a member of the State Council Health Reform Advisory Commission and the only economist on China's national COVID-19 expert panel. Dr. Zijie Zhen is director of the China Country Office, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Zhen leads the foundation's efforts to develop and strengthen partnership across China's public, private, and nonprofit sectors to advance health and development outcomes in China and globally. He has served as a senior leader at the School of Public Health at Peking University and at Shanghai Jiaotong University. Before I turn the mic to uh, Dr. Frieden, I do have a few housekeeping remarks. Uh, first, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Committee of 100 website next week. Second, uh, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit questions anytime during the webinar. We will address as many questions as possible towards the uh, last half an hour. At the end of the webinar, please do uh, complete a short survey to share your feedback. Thank you. Now, Dr. Frieden. Thank you so very much. And I'm honored to be part of this uh, very important panel and this very important dialogue. COVID has many, many lessons for every country in the world. And there is every likelihood that a more contagious or more lethal virus could emerge in the coming years. COVID has killed millions, has harmed economies, and uh, has cost trillions of dollars. What we need to do as a world, every country, and as a world globally collaborating is to get what we call, at least in English, the three R's right, a renaissance in public health, robust primary health care, and resilient individuals and communities. In terms of the first R, a renaissance in public health, every outbreak needs to be found quickly, reported quickly, and effectively responded to. A global target for that is known as 717, that every outbreak would be identified within seven days, reported within one day, and an effective response in place within seven days, every outbreak in every country of the world. To succeed, the world will need sustained investment, especially in the lower income countries, especially in Africa, and technical expertise so that those financial resources are transformed into functional capacities. That also means stronger organizations around the world, global and national, with improved technical and managerial capacity. The second key area is robust primary health care. Primary health care should be central to healthcare systems, and this is the focus to improve health. Accountable, high quality primary health care is essential for health progress. This means staffing by multidisciplinary teams so that doctors can manage the more complicated patients and a larger patient panel. It means patient-centered care with convenient, affordable, culturally competent care with no financial barriers to access. And it should be equipped to prevent and manage infectious and chronic disease. That way, the primary health care system can rapidly diagnose conditions in the course of regular care, provide rapid treatment, and vaccinate. In every country of the world, there is hesitancy or reluctance to get vaccinated. And one of the most effective ways of getting people vaccinated is for them to have their own family doctor, a primary care doctor or nurse practitioner, who can provide the kind of trusted information that encourages people to get vaccinated. 
Furthermore, strong primary health care can strengthen individual, family, and community resilience against health threats, so that if there is a health threat, people are less likely to get severely ill. When people have poorly treated hypertension or diabetes or obstructive lung disease, they're more likely to get severely ill from an infection such as COVID or influenza. And third, resilient individuals and communities. Globally, we'll be stronger and more productive economically and live longer, healthier lives with lower health care costs. If we end the tobacco epidemic by implementing comprehensive tobacco control, protect people from unhealthy food, and promote wholesome, low-sodium, sustainable, farmer-supportive food production and distribution, and promote healthy physical activity, including community design to promote walking and bicycling, reduce air and water pollution, reduce harmful alcohol use, and protect our children from addiction to tobacco, alcohol, drugs, and inappropriate marketing by unhealthy food companies. The virus respects no borders. We really are all in this together. We are all under the same sky. We're all subject to the same microbes. This is a great area not only to build global trust, but to build global resilience. Strengthening national health and public health helps all countries. It lifts all boats, but it requires country commitment, effective governance with whole of government and collaboration around the world, more resources for the low-income countries and more effective use of funds, and technical excellence. Success will require new ways of working together that recognize the reality so vividly illustrated by the COVID-19 pandemic that we do depend on one another and can be accountable to one another for improving and protecting health. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Friedan. And next, we have a Dr. George Gao. Um, thank you very much. I think we are discussing something about a preventing a diversity uh, pandemic. So the first question would be, you know, will we have another pandemic? Think about the, the, in this century, the 21st century, we already have seven public health emergency of international concerns, you know, starting from 2009 pandemic influenza until the recent uh, monkeypox, you could do the COVID-19. So obviously everybody's asking the question, all this, you could do the COVID-19, is a black swan or it's a really, uh, uh, it's really, it, you know, it's something is a really great rhino event. You know, you the GPMB, Global Preparedness Monitoring Board Annual Report 2019, we claim flu and coronavirus are the most likely uh, pandemic uh, pathogens you know, for the future. Unfortunately, we are not ready. Here today, US and China, we are discussing about it for the next, next um, 50 years or so. So, you know, we have to work together to get ourselves ready. So this is why we have this. Actually, and uh, the Johns Hopkins um, University organized uh, event 201. There, we suspected we have a uh, viral disease called CAPS, coronavirus-associated uh, 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 pneumonia syndrome. That was 2019, October 18th. So we already know there must be a coronavirus coming soon. So I was there in New York City, and the Tom, uh, Dr. Fried is there as well. So I remind you, you know, it's it's always there. Even in 2018, I was asked by General Cell. So what can we do for the next emerging infectious diseases? I said we can only we can only do. The scientific surveillance and invest for science. So actually, we have already seven plus two coronaviruses infecting human beings. SARS, the first one, two two ninety, and then after that, we have so many. I'll just show you. You know, a lot of coronavirus already there. You could do the COVID nineteen. We are expecting your next one. Definitely, there will be someone something there. Why do we have so many coronavirus? So many emerging viruses because of the you know, human behavior change, because of uh, climate change, you know, all these ecological changes is always there. So this is, um, I was asked in 2016. 
So about the epidemiology, genetic recombination, and pathogenesis of coronavirus. There, I said in that journal, it is likely not a matter of if, but when the next recombinant curve will emerge and cause another outbreak in human population. This article was published in 2016. And why and how we did, what we should do together for primary uh, care, health care. So I'm, I was asked by the public health, uh, uh, let's say the public health journal. I wrote something to say, okay, strengthening the public health at community level. And this is also why China can do for the last two years for the COVID, zero COVID strategy, because we have a very strong community level. We will discuss this later. And uh, I want to stress more about private health care. And in the last state, I will ask, wrote a paper, I'm seeing science-based public involvement and sweet administration strategy. So this is the thing we can do together. So for the science and for the administration, must be science-based, public involved, and uh, the decision making. Now I want to remind everybody: after this, we while we are in this pandemic, we have new pollutants here. So we have to be careful about all these, uh, you know, uh, masks and uh, everything. For see the future, what we can do, U.S. and China, we we got to do something together, solidarity. China and U.S. must do something together. What can we do again? Surveillance and invest in size. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Dao. So we have uh, three R from Dr. Frieden and three S from Dr. Gao. It's building pressure for our next speaker, Dr. Copeland. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I won't offer any more letters. Uh, you've got enough to remember and, and use. But um, in keeping with both Dr. Frieden and Dr. Gao's comments that are complementary to each other, I'd like to add that where, where Dr. Gao ended, the comments that, <clears throat> that some kind of co collaboration and cooperation have got to exist I'm up with many partners, but certainly the two largest economies in the world. And those with um, the most sophistication in a lot of this matter are at hand and we're talking to each other now, but that needs to continue. And, and the content of those discussions needs to be both before there's a crisis, during the crisis and after it. There are obviously details in each of those periods that um, are different, but they all need to be addressed. And with that must come greater scientific literacy amongst our leaders, our colleagues, and the public at large. Our ability to transform uh, the environment into one which is uh, very quick and effective and complete in stopping transmission of a, of a pot potential pandemic, likely viral, uh, that requires uh, some scientific understanding. They don't have to become scientists, but they have to appreciate what counts and what doesn't count and what price we pay when we ignore the science. Um, that means uh, in addition to concentrating on current leaders, it includes future leaders. So just that as we expect our children to be literate in math and literate in literature and history and various sciences, we also need, they need them to be competent and understanding of health issues so that when a crisis like this occurs, there is a larger lay population ready to listen to the suggestions, able to interpret and understand them and put them into place. And as such, uh, the public can play a key role as well in minimizing the risk or ending it um, in their individual countries. The, um, that covers a, a need for science, a need for policy and understanding what policies are put into place and needs to be invested in. Uh, a major format of these pandemics in country after country are 
we don't have to worry about it too much. Or if we worry about it, it's with lip service, meaning we just talk about it. But in terms of actually preparing our cities, towns, countryside, urban areas, and when I say our, it's not just the US or just China, it's everybody's uh, need and response because by definition, the pandemic goes everywhere. And so if there's cases in a cluster in Angola and there's cases in a cluster in Paraguay, those have to get as much attention as cases in other parts of the country. And then a final item in which uh, we needed to do better is communication to the public at large, as well as to leaders and to each other. That communication can be in the form of data as to what's going on in our country. And as such, um, that, that sharing of information can be data, can be uh, scientific information on how a disease is spreading, uh, what are the characteristics of the disease and how is the virus changing to threaten us? All those uh, need to be part of, the, of our approach and not wait for a pandemic, but have those ready and able to be deployed uh, when, a, when a crisis occurs. Certainly, and I don't like to necessarily use a military analogy or a sports analogy, um, one has to be prepared well ahead of time for um, an event that may not occur right away or may occur very quickly, that may be um, evolved from something we've seen already like coronavirus, or maybe something quite different that comes down the road. But what we can absolutely be sure of is that there will be more of these events, some of them more amenable to dissemination, some of them more localized in their approach, but all of them threats to our health and that's health everywhere. So where, where there's um, a calming down of, of interest, you know, sooner or later, and this is true of, of this pandemic, already people are saying, well, it's not that dangerous anymore. It's almost over. We can just go back to what we did before. That cannot take place. We cannot go back to what we did before because we didn't do enough and we didn't do it quickly enough. And those um, errors in operation and response and numbers of people needed to track cases and determine their boundaries, that has got to be part and parlor of our um, armamentarium of what we're gonna do. And to do that, there needs to be investment. So you can't get off on the cheap on this. We're gonna have to pay for it, but with a million seemingly dead or more in the US, we're paying a price for it now and have been paying a price for several years, we need to start spending it up front and spending it on things that control the disease, prevent spread and further passage of the disease, and give us scientific tools, whether they be vaccines or chemotherapeutic agents or whatever they might be, uh, that will help us triumph over the disease uh, one after another. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dr. Kaufman. Thanks for sharing your insight, as always. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Boyne uh, Liu. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to share two of my observations on the pandemic issues um, to be discussed today. Uh, first is on the opportunity cost to fight against the pandemic. Over the past three years since the pandemic outbreak in early 2020, this highly contagious disease has deeply affected all human life and work directly or indirectly. In response, all countries have taken various measures in response for both prevention and treatment goals. Looking back, I think there's so much to learn and revisit from what we have done similarly or differently across international borders. On the one hand, thanks to the medical innovation, we do have many positive accomplishments to celebrate and be grateful for, such as the global access to vaccine within 2020, uh, 2020, at the end of 2020. 
and oral treatment drugs that are available last year, 2021, that saved the millions of lives at the virus led high risks. On the other hand, following the societal virus containment measures and healthcare interventions leading towards the COVID patients, we also must not underestimate the pervasive opportunity cost we pay, including limited care for patients with other severe conditions such as cancer or chemotherapy or cardiovascular problems, as well as the upward poverty trend observed in many developing countries due to the reduced economic growth. Now, one may reject the economic trade-off argument by putting life above money, which may be true for individual choice at own cost. But like or not, at a population level, money and life can be the two sides of a life coin because under shared economy with public programs, once you use more money with the cost to others, and then more importantly, uh, total, less total money means more poverty, and more poverty means fewer to survive. In fact, as you all know, poverty is the leading killer, taking away more than five to six millions of lives globally every single year, most of them, unfortunately, were children. My second point touches upon the digital transformation in response to the pandemic, in response to the human-to-human -human transmission of the disease. We humans must either stop interactions for short run surviving or find a way out to continue our work and life in the long run. Among many innovations, digital technologies plays a central role in helping humans meet the distancing requirements for all activities that can be switched to online, virtually, or automatic substitution for human body involvement. Although digital technology can transform almost all sectors to a various degree, healthcare, in my view, is among the few that are mostly promoted digitally in the past three years. And it's for two primary reasons. First, healthcare is one, one of the most service intensive sectors offering greater room for technological transformation. Second, healthcare is about changes in the risk of disease and death, leading regulators to set high bars on safety requirements. But because of the virus driving force for human distancing, virtual care gains much greater um, uh, uh, advantages uh, relative to the office-based uh, services as we used to uh, obtain. So in any case, a fast trend of digital transformation has been well observed in healthcare, offering two important implications that, I, that need to be noticed. First, a positive one, is labor productivity improvement resulting from the labor saving digital technologies to allow more AI based online services or remote medicine. Second, there is also an increase the concern on digital divides against the disadvantaged groups. Here, primarily, I refer to the people with poor economic, educational, or cognitive constraints to participate in the digital economy unless the effective targeted public programs available to help their ability or subsidize them directly, the disadvantaged groups would be left increasingly behind the digital economy. For healthcare in particular, the increased digital divides may not only affect the income of the service providers being substituted, but perhaps also on patient welfare because of some dehuman services in place for healthcare. 
Um, I will stop here, Adam. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Liu. It's really uh, great to hear from a fellow economist. Thanks. And last but not the least, uh, um, we'll have Dr. Zijian Chen. Thank you, Adam. Uh, it's really a delight to be a part of this panel. Uh, I just want to add that uh, health equity or health inequality is a huge issue during the pandemic. And uh, in the last three years, we have observed uh, uh, why the inequality in terms of uh, vaccine uh, distribution. And uh, obviously we see that uh, particularly among low income countries, uh, less than 25% of uh, uh, population received at least one dose of uh, uh, vaccine. Uh, despite that uh, we have uh, witnessed the unprecedented uh, uh, innovation in the uh, uh, vaccine development. Where within a year, we, uh, the world created multiple versions of uh, uh, COVID uh, 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 vaccines. So health uh, equality has always been at the center of uh, Gates Foundation's work. And uh, over the last three years, we have invested over $2 billion in the uh, pandemic response, particularly in support those in the low income country uh, to, to, for, for their responses. We we'll continue uh, invest uh, in uh, pandemic preparedness and the response, particularly in five areas. As uh, Dr. Fina just said that uh, a strength health system and the invest in the primary health care is hugely important to develop the uh, resilience uh, in, in, in healthcare. We also invest in uh, enhanced integrated disease surveillance to ensure that, that we can uh, uh, have a much earlier uh, warning system to allow uh, us to uh, respond earlier. We also work with uh, global partners to catalyze a global pandemic corps, which uh, is a workforce responsible for global uh, 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 preparedness and the responses. So hopefully well, this uh, will be something that uh, 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 well, we, 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 we can develop, we will see uh, such a, a team uh, develop. We are also invest uh, in um, accelerating the research and development of new vaccines and the new treatment and the delivery tools to ensure that uh, uh, we can uh, quickly uh, a response to uh, a, a, a such a, a pandemic. For example, CEPI has uh, called for that uh, 100 day of uh, vaccine development. So this is a, a huge undertaking, of course. And finally, as uh, Dr. Copeland mentioned that the finance uh, uh, is hugely important. We need a resource to finance effective uh, pandemic preparedness and, uh, and the response. So what we have learned from uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, this uh, really reminds us that, that we are all interconnected. This crisis presents us with uh, a major opportunity to emerge stronger, more prepared, and more equal. And certainly as, as uh, a person, we work with, uh, with China in quite extensively, and China has an uh, uh, indispensable role to play in finding solution, design pathway, sharing experiences, mobilize resource, and ensuring the implementation, all of which are really critical for our success in making uh, COVID the last pandemic. And with, work, working with the Chinese partner from uh, public and private sectors over the last 15 years, we have seen China's potential to become a major contributor to global health equity. And we have also witnessed tremendous impact that can be made when the China's life-saving innovation and expertise reach those most in need around the world. So, uh, so for, uh, uh, for our office, we support well, mainly from, uh, as, as part of the foundation that we support China, China in terms of research development into a new and affordable vaccine that protect families in China and around the world. And we have uh, pharmaceutical companies scale up their manufacturing capacity and meet international quality standards like uh, 
WHO PQs, so as to help fill the gap in vaccine equity and accessibility around the world. We work with uh, uh, government agencies and private sectors to support uh, a, a Chinese supply vac a vaccine in the public goods through multilateral uh, initiatives such as uh, Gavi uh, and other uh, mechanisms. And uh, certainly we encourage the expansion of uh, national immunization program in trying to ensure that uh, more critical vaccines are made available for uh, free for those who need. So all this work and this part of uh, 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 effort that uh, we, uh, we, are, we are working. And obviously, uh, uh, China and the uh, United States uh, as the two largest economy, uh, the future really depends on how well uh, these two countries work together in terms, in terms of all aspect of uh, pandemic prepare, uh, preparedness and uh, response. So I look forward to uh, in-depth discussion uh, down there. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chen, and thanks, everyone. Uh, this is a, a great uh, um, discussion on the uh, uh, how to prevent the next pandemic. We do have a, a couple of questions, which is uh, more aligned with the US-China 2050 uh, initiative. And uh, um, we do have a question for the panelists. Uh, first question is the what's coming in the next 30 years also uh, for public health in China and the United States? And uh, how the next years, 30 years or so might look like uh, a, uh, for a uh, next pandemic? Do we have any panelists who want to take on this? I see Dr. Frieden has unmuted. Well, I'll just say that we can anticipate, as has been said by the other panelists, that we will continue to see the emergence of health threats. In fact, we may well see them at a faster and faster pace because of our increasing encroachment on uh, the natural world and because of the closer um, interchange among people. This is happening. Um, we'll also see the continuing threat of non-communicable diseases, making our populations more vulnerable and uh, things such as uh, injuries, which make things very challenging. So I think um, we're going to see challenges like this. And uh, one of the really most important things that we can do is to make sure that we're learning best practices from around the world and adapting them, recognizing that we really are all in this together. And if one, uh, country or community identifies uh, a better way of finding an outbreak quickly, diagnosing it or treating it or vaccinating against it, uh, it's very important that it be shared. That's That's been all of our best interest. So I think um, what we hope will happen over the coming decades is more of a global collaboration to prevent, detect, and respond to health threats. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. Uh, can I go to Dr. Copeland? Well, I would certainly um, agree with uh, Dr. Frieden and, and his summary of what's going on. Uh, I think, however, this is a, a um, this won't be easy. And no one should think it's going to be easy or particularly short lived. So all the things that Dr. Frieden enumerated as being important, the vaccine development and an adequate workforce, well trained and a wide range of skills and technologies. Um, we need to be working on those. We need we need to have, we did start some of them during the pandemic, but uh, there's too much talk of the pandemic being over. Well, is it over? And you hear it on television and people talking about it. Um, others may disagree, but I have complete confidence that we are not overestimating this. We are. We have a severe threat out there, which has many cousins and brothers and sisters of you know slightly different viruses or new ones to come aboard. 
And we need to be working right now towards doing things for them as well. Uh, so it's, um, it's, it shouldn't be delayed. It shouldn't be postponed. It shouldn't be minimized. It needs to be discussed. It needs to be have tangible evidence of support. And uh, that will make us better prepared. But if we keep doing what we've been doing for 50 years, uh, responding to something when it seems a threat, letting it you know, quietly sleep a period of time and then coming back and then going back and forth without really a well-funded, well-equipped, well-educated team, uh, we're going to be back here again in a similar discussion. Thank you, Dr. Copeland. So we have heard from the U.S. perspective, Dr. Copeland and Dr. Frieden. Uh, I said that Dr. Uh, Liu has unmuted. Dr. Liu, do you want to take on this? Well, I would, okay, let me give it a shot. Um, yeah, uh, speaking for the future um, scenarios um, for the U.S.-China collaboration and, and with other countries to fight against a global pandemic uh, next, I think um, one of the areas that we probably should pay attention to in addition to uh, the virus-led pandemic um, that is, um, that is um, the issue of um, drug-resistant infections that could be caused by um, antibiotic resistance, right? And as we all know, um, the, the, the development of antibiotics is one of the most innovative revolutionary uh, achievements in 20th century. That helped so many people in so many countries for so many decades. But now we all observe that antibiotics has been way over utilized or abused in many places. And some estimates show that if we continue to behave as the way uh, we, we have been, um, then the, the antibiotic um, uh, issues could, um, could, could, could be very um, uh, devastating uh, in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of death tolls, um, it, it could go as high as over 10, uh, 10 million people um, to be killed without uh, effective uh, antibiotics available in 2050. So I think that's, that's one key area that we um, should really pay attention to uh, if China and US can collaborate more effectively together because these are the two largest economies and we also use a lot of antibiotics uh, for both human health care, animal care and agriculture productions. So I think that that's something I, I would strongly recommend that we all pay attention to and we all should make efforts. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Liu. Dr. Gao, do you want to respond to the question? I, yes, uh, Dr. Kapley and Dr. Frieda, and Dr. Liu, you know, comment for that very well. I do agree with all their comments. I think, you know, like Dr. Liu mentioned, even the MDR, you know, these are to all those viruses. It's a very, very serious problem. I mean, with this um, webinar, we should, everybody should realize public health issue, every public health issue is global. So global public health is real. Not any a single country or single person, you can do anything about public health because it is public. So this is one, you know, when I'm, uh, you my last slide, I said that, and also I want to say, if we don't unite together, we, we, if we cannot line up, the virus will line up, and the public health issue will line up, like the food uh, problems and also MDR. So this is a, we should learn a lesson from what we have been experiencing for the COVID-19, you know. I'm, I would ask the question, did we unite together for this pand pandemic preparedness and all the measures? My answer is no. You know, for the whole world, 
we cannot work together. So this is a real lesson we should learn for the future. And for see the future, to prevent all these um, you know, problems, we have to develop more tools for the diagnosis, for the vaccines, and uh, for the drugs. All this, we have to everything together. Like Dr. Copley mentioned, you know, anything we are doing or we are claiming at the moment, it's not overestimated. This is something we should realize. And we, when I say we, including the professionals, scientists, and uh, ex-prisoners, you know, everybody and the public. So this is something we should learn for the future. Thank you, that's my comment. Great, thanks, Dr. Kao. And Dr. Chen? Well, well, thank you. Well, I think uh, uh, for for panelists that's covered very well. And uh, but uh, at the foundation we call the impatient optimist. But in some way that uh, in light of uh, of uh, geopolitical uh, competition and the situation U.S.-China relation, and uh, this uh, really prevent us to work together in in more. In in in, in, uh, in uh, closely, I recall uh, twenty years ago, and I was uh, U.S. CDC epidemiologist. I was uh, sent to Beijing uh, in helping uh, control of uh, SARS uh, uh, in Beijing at that time, and uh, well, certainly this is as a part of the WHO team, and uh, we see much more closer, much more close relationship in terms of uh, 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 almost everything. And, uh, but on the way that uh, uh, from this uh, pandemic and obviously uh, the political situation uh, is totally uh, different. And uh, so how we can really uh, make sure that the two countries work together uh, in a way that in light of uh, competition, but we can still work together on global health issue collaboration. This is something that uh, should be part of uh, uh, not thinking and action for everyone. And uh, certainly I see Committee of 100 has a role to play uh, in the future, make sure that uh, and all, all academic and uh, every work of society, well, we need to work together. Uh, definitely. Thank you, Dr. Chen. I was wondering uh, if panelists have uh, uh, comments, additional comments, or respond to any of the uh, comments from the uh, Dr. Uh, one of the panelists. If not, uh, well, I, I think Dr. Zheng's comment actually directs to the uh, Next question is, what would international collaboration like uh, by 2050? What can international organizations and foundations can do to prevent the next pandemic? Uh, we support cooperation from both China and the US. I think Dr. Jim probably touched a, li a little bit on this. Dr. Copeland. I think it could be fantastic welcomed and incredibly productive. We're not there yet, but around China and around the US, walk into any laboratory. There are colleagues there from around the world um, in US labs and whether it's in US CDC and in National Health, Health, there are Chinese citizens working side by side with American citizens. In fact, they don't care <laughs> about whether they're citizens or not. They're working on a a global problem and seeking solutions by putting their knowledge uh, and their energy into something that they can share with others. And whether it's in universities across China or, uh, or institutions, um, there are many people, even with the strains and stresses between our countries, there are people who enjoy working with their counterparts in the US or in China or in England, Australia or wherever it may be, and they get so much more out of it. And there's so much more 
satisfaction in the work that that's going to continue. I think you, that's that's hard to stop. Uh, you know, people may not like it. There may, may be government uh, make it hard to do that. But we've all had a taste of how um, uh, productive we feel and how um, how positive it is to work with colleagues from different parts of the world, come up with common solutions, and then apply the solutions. So we we um, eradicated smallpox in that way. Look at the teams in smallpox. There were people from Russia and China and Australia and you name it, they were working together and they had a common goal and succeeded. And I certainly think we can do the same in this. Uh, even if you're, there may be a struggle, it may be uh, challenging to get good governments um, um, working together and being um, more positive towards each other. But even if that doesn't happen, the scientists themselves will step forward and say, we need to do better at this. We can do it better with colleagues from other countries, whether it's the US and China, but that's a good example of it, having it done. And, um, and then philanthropies and other funding sources can reward that and say, uh, let, let us help you with this grant. Let us help you develop this new vaccine. Let us um, show, demonstrate the value of this approach versus that approach. Um, I see it all happening, maybe not as fast as I or others may want, but we shouldn't lose energy and steam on this. We, we need to keep pushing that there is far more to lose by not having good collaboration, transparent collaboration, sharing data, ensuring that that data is accurate as best we can make out. All that needs to take place and it will. Thank you, Dr. Copeland. And I see Dr. Gao has unmuted. Dr. Gao. Yes, I think I do agree all the comments from Dr. Copeland. And the scientists, the professionals, and we are still doing very good collaboration. For see the future, I don't think this is, could be any problem. The thing is, we both sides, we should push very hard for the politicians to line up, to realize, you know, the US, China, like uh, Dr. Friedrich said, you know, is the two largest uh, economy, economic uh, country. We should line up. And for the whole, can we line up? We might want to, like uh, Dr. Adam, you mentioned, should we have some other kind of uh, organizations? For that, I think Dr. Chen from the Gates Foundation can help to you know, organize a new organization or something like that. Uh, how can we work together? Or like uh, Gordon's um, US-China uh, track to dialogue. You know, we really need that. We need some common voice from both sides to call for united action from both sides. I think this is something we should say for the, for say the future for 2050. Uh, I'm very confident, you know, we could do something together like we have done, like we are doing. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. I think uh, Dr. Liu has been cute and Dr. Liu. Uh, hey, um, yeah, um, speaking of um, uh, the global collaboration, I think it is no doubt that data sharing uh, is at the heart of of, of digital economy for collab for global collaboration, especially for healthcare, which uh, obviously involves with uh, critical information and interventions on human biology and human development. Uh, although data security has long been a central issue to care about when conducting health research in the past, I think it is never more important than today when the world starts the digital era where big data becomes a dominating source of power to determine the future progress of human health and economic development. Uh, in the meantime, however, making a, a, a efficient use of big data involves great costs as well, including both the patient's uh, privacy and national security in particular. Um, unfortunately, it is not an easy job if, if, if not an impossible mission for any country to find the optimal approach to balancing the productivity gains versus potential security uh, risk. When it comes to global health um, collaboration and the risks 
posed by the future pandemics, I think international data sharing would have to be more critical and, and more sensitive than, than domestic use. Well, I don't uh, pretend to be an expert in the field, nor do I expect this panel to offer satisfied solutions. What I would suggest is to revisit how we humankind have arrived at where we are. In my humble opinion, uh, global collaboration uh, in human history can never be possible without mutual trust and bearing some limited risks, right? So looking forward on global efforts to promote um, uh, uh, human health, we cannot uh, and we should not expect a world with free of risk for data security while sharing, right? So, but rather kind of um, more mutual trust and courage that may be built with better common value in the future, especially between China and the US. Back to you. Adam. Thanks, Dr. Liu. I'm curious if Dr. Friedrich or Dr. Zhen do you uh, want to comment on this question, US and China and international organizations? I think the comments that have been made already are, are exactly uh, correct. And uh, I do think that the more we can recognize that we're unified against a common enemy, which is microbes, the better off we'll do. And the more we share knowledge about the risks, share knowledge about the epidemiology, share knowledge about the countermeasures and how to develop and apply them, the better off we are. I think there are also broader lesson sharing as well. For example, best practices in primary health care. Uh, one of the silver linings of the pandemic has been the explosive growth of telemedicine as a way of extending care and making it more efficient. That has to be done carefully within boundaries. And as mentioned earlier, addressing some of the digital divide issues and access issues. But it's a, it's a great step forward in potentially improving the accessibility and quality of care. It's not the answer to everything or every visit, but it's an important tool and technology. So learning lessons with each other, uh, walking down that path of knowledge together, I think is very important. And as, as Dr. Copeland mentioned, during the height of the Cold War between the United States and the then Soviet Union, there was still a collaboration on smallpox eradication because health can be a bridge for peace. And we hope that that will uh, continue in the coming years and decades. Thanks, Dr. Friedman. Dr. Chen? No. Okay. Well, I uh, just want uh, well, to resonate with uh, what uh, Gordon just said, that uh, well, the trust and the confidence uh, is important in, uh, in Chinese context. And uh, with that, certain level of uh, trust and confidence, collaboration will be a problem. So now the issue is how we can really build or develop such a, a, a trust and, and, and a confidence. Great, thanks. Thanks to you all for the uh, insights on these questions. We do have a uh, a lot, uh, quite a number of questions from the audience. And I think the first one is very uh, interesting is, what's your take on the uh, outbreak response strategies in different countries? And what would be your suggestions, how to gather the best practice globally and get prepared for any future uh, pandemics? Dr. Kaplan. <laughs> I'm either brave or foolish to try to answer this question, but um, the, the, the uh, um, the, the working together uh, is, is certainly doable. Um, support for that, I think is doing and will be continued. I think one, one thing uh, that 
hasn't fully been discussed is there's an interest in primary care and to improve primary care and to disseminate it more broadly to deal with the pandemic. But there also needs to be a better working relationship between healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, whoever, and the public. And the, I know this has been a challenge for China for some time, uh, but that will continue. And so that when we, when we talk about um, adding to the burden of the tax medical system uh, where people want to hear their problems discussed and they want to um, appropriately and they want to have a sense of um, um, of solution and what and what the might be and that there's hope for them in this and where there isn't some uh, concern and um, warmth and uh, human kindness exhibited in the systems uh, we all strive towards these things, but these are part of the issues here, and they'll need to be addressed just the way vaccines are improved and built upon. The medical teams will need to be improved and built upon, and, and both our countries in different ways. I, I think this is a, a, a very, thank you. I think this is a very important question because uh, every country is different. Every country has its own strengths and weaknesses and context, but there are best practices from around the world. And in my, my group, Resolve to Save Life, we've, we've looked at that some. And I, I, can, I can mention really uh, many that are really important for every country to learn from. Every country can learn from every other country. Uh, there, there's, there's no country that did this perfectly. There's no country that has all of the answers. Um, but if you look at, for example, informing the public by alert levels to say when there's a particular risk of COVID so that people can adapt themselves. Countries like Singapore have been doing that very, very well. And that's a very powerful uh, risk communication tool to empower people. So uh, it's kind of like the, the weather, you know, it's going to be raining COVID hard outside, wear your mask. Um, Another uh, best practice is in communication and community engagement. And we've seen countries as varied as Finland and South Africa be very effective at reaching many different parts of society. Because in virtually every country, there are some parts of society that don't trust uh, parts of the government. Uh, you know, in the US, you have, for example, um, many of the people who voted for former President Trump are very resistant to getting vaccinated. Well, if public health can't reach those people, it's going to fail. So community community engagement is very important. There are best practices with testing. If you look at a country like South Korea, very early on, very rapid testing. And of course, China has done massive amounts of testing. Um, contact tracing, when that was still a core uh, method, when we had a much less infectious COVID strain than Omicron, uh, China was really showing the world how to do very excellent contact tracing, and that may be relevant for various different situations in the future. Economic protection of people at greatest risk. Denmark really showed the way of how to protect people so there wouldn't be economic loss. And similarly, whether it's vaccination or primary health care or protection of the elderly, there are countries that have gotten a lot right and that all countries can learn something from. But the the big issue is how to be adaptive. The virus changes. And uh, unless we also adapt, we'll be behind. So uh, this virus has really surprised us in how rapidly it's changed. It was very infectious when it first came out, and it's only gotten more and more and more infectious. And we don't know what the future will hold. So we have to be ready for the virus to adapt. So I think that the really best uh, practices around the world is countries that have understood what's happening in the epidemiology and virology, and then rapidly adapted with the tools that are available and the application of those tools. I think that the other part of this question is, um, what do we do globally to get prepared for a future pandemic? And here, I think that's a, a big question. Uh, we obviously need to collaborate on things like uh, new vaccines globally against new threats. Uh, trying to find vaccines that will work against many strains of influenza, platform technologies, 
better diagnostics, as mentioned earlier, addressing antimicrobial resistance, which is also a major threat. But I do want to come back to my earlier comment about 717. 717 is a suggested goal for the world, for every country, every outbreak, that every outbreak would be identified within seven days, reported to public health within one, and all essential control measures in place in seven days. We've been working with countries around the world to pilot this approach. And what we found is that it's, it's a way of rapidly finding and fixing problems. And it's also an accountability metric so that all of us can say, are we set up to be better prepared for whatever comes next from the microbial world? And what more can we do to drive down the risk of spillover events from nature or of other ways that uh, uh, viruses or bacteria could enter the human uh, the circulation among uh, humanity? Because that's in all of our best interests. Thank you. Sorry. Yep, I am here. Um, sorry, I was muted. Uh, Dr. Go or Dr. Liu, do you want to chime in? Uh, okay. All right. So, so yes. Um, uh, yes, um, it, is, it is clear that uh, different countries have, have, have taken uh, very different uh, measures in response to the pandemic. Um, and that certainly make um, some uh, difference um, in the control of, uh, uh, of the disease in terms of infections or uh, disease conditions or um, death tolls. Uh, but there is an interesting observation uh, about the relationship between, um, between the uh, infection uh, outcomes and economic uh, uh, capacity in terms of GDP per capita. We find you, you, if you just go look for the aggregate data at the international level, you will find rich, um, on average, richer countries pay much higher price um, to uh, to the pandemic than the poorer countries. So, so I think that is something we really need to think about when we try to assess how much role that we human efforts really have uh, ha have made in terms of uh, in terms of the variations in in, in the outcomes. Actually, we uh, uh, I myself uh, and, and some colleagues have done an empirical study recently using um, data from 85 countries. And based on our econometric models, uh, we find that a government response stringency and speed together explained only about 10% of the variations in the, in the prevalence of COVID-19 uh, across countries. While the degree of uh, individualism explains about 6.18% of the variations and also um, um, the COVID-19 lifestyle and uh, impact of other uh, time invariant, but country invariant, fa uh, in invariant factors together explain almost half of the variation, suggesting that important roles remain for nature and other non-observable conditions that, that jointly determine the pandemic dynamics. So, so I think one lesson we probably can learn from what we observed in this past two, three years is we human probably should be more humble than, than we, 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 we thought we should be able to do something. Uh, so, I said, um, so, 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 so that's something I, I like to share with you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Du. Dr. Gao? Yes, uh, you know, different countries um, uh, have their own different systems and uh, different uh, politicians and different uh, professionals. So that's how sewer. And uh, from what we are doing, uh, what we learn from this pandemic, you know, different countries are using the different strategies, uh, like Dr. Friedman mentioned, 
I think Singapore maybe is like the, it's running either you know intermediate uh, strategy. It's not like in China or not like in the U.S. or Europe. Um, you know, like they are doing so well. You know, for China, we are we we have been running for the zero COVID for a while, for almost three years, two and a half. And um, you know, for that strategy, think about uh, uh, life saving. You know, for that strategy, you know, we save the time for the development of the vaccines and the therapeutics, and also we save the lives. Uh, of course, not, not every country can do that. Like I, I mentioned from my, my early introduction, uh, PPT. So I mentioned because we have a very strong community level um, capacity, public health capacity. And Dr. Friedel also mentioned about the contact tracking. So that's something you can only do in China from the very beginning, because we have a strong uh, community level capacity. We have enough manpower and we have enough facility to trace those uh, you know, uh, close contacts or even the secondary close contacts. So this is a very, very good example in different country can introduce different uh, strategy. Um, think about the um, death tolls in China and in the rest of the world. So far, you know, we save a lot of lives. However, as you see, now we are we are having a very big challenge. I hope you know we are doing very we are working very hard to start to try to you know follow up to learn the lesson, to learn the experience. What you have been doing, you know, for the rest of the world. Think you know retrospectively. Think about what we have done for the human being, for the COVID nineteen. We we missed two chances to eradicate the virus. In the first. If, that's a very good, if, if we were able to identify the virus earlier, you know, if we know this is a, you know, it's a devastating virus much earlier, of course, you know, that is a if. And oh, if we can really, we could really line up for the whole world. Like when China tried to do the lockdown, if everyone's, you know, line up together to do the lockdown, Maybe we will push the virus to you know, move to the animal host. Now give some time, say one year or two or a few months. The, you know, the most devastating virus if can move to the virus host for a while, say half a year or one year. And then we wouldn't have the, you know, the, the prototype virus we identified from Wuhan. That is very, very pathogenic. So we lost that. That is the second chance. We didn't do the lockdown for the whole world. Of course, it's very hard. Why? Because the different countries, different systems, and the different understanding of the damage of this virus. So this is something we really should work, you know, sit together to discuss, to write down for our next generation. You know, this is the lessons we should learn. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kao. Dr. Chen. Well, it's well discussed, and I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Thanks. We do have a, um, a, a question um, about, uh, uh, actually, I think it's probably for Dr. Frieden and Dr. Jen. Uh, there were initiatives preventing the next pandemic, including the Germ Initiative by Gates Foundation, the Ending Pandemic Initiative operating from Salzburg, and also Dr. Frieden, the uh, efforts by Resolve to Save Lives. Um, his question is to um, how these initiatives are uh, co uh, coordinated, and if not, how can these initiatives be better coordinated? Thank you, it's a, it's a great question, not an easy one. I think we have to start with the recognition that public health is fundamentally a public responsibility. And therefore, one of the most important roles, even for non-governmental organizations, is to support governments of the world to strengthen their public health systems. That is uh, core. And that includes the World Health Organization. 
Uh, the World Health Organization has come in for criticism from various uh, quarters, but fundamentally, it is what the world created. It does what the world allows it to do. And uh, one of the things that I think all people working in preparedness and prevention of epidemics should do is to work to strengthen the public systems, both the international public systems and governmental programs. No non-governmental organization, no philanthropy is going to fix preparedness for the world. This is only going to happen by the governments of the world. But there is a very important role for organizations um, such as ours and others in supporting governments and providing technical inputs, helping to more rapidly share lessons from around the world, advocating and supporting people within countries to advocate for stronger public health systems and public health programs. So uh, there's, a, there's a very important role for non-governmental entities in helping to shape uh, the governmental response. But fundamentally, this is a public sector problem. I look forward to hearing what the, my colleague from the Gates Foundation has to say. Well, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Friesen's uh, comments. Well, uh, NGOs can do only stuff, uh, really. Uh, for, for, for this foundation, our role mainly to convene, uh, advocate, uh, uh, and uh, in some way that uh, use uh, leadership voice to adv uh, advocate for, 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 for certain work. And uh, we do uh, work through WHO or other multilateral system like uh, Global Fund, Gavi, SEPI, and, uh, and other organizations that we have uh, invested he heavily. But through this kind of a partnership and the mechanism that we can really uh, make make an impact, and many uh, investment while we see was well, certain from a uh, 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 global fund and Gavi and Sapien, we 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 see that uh, already the system uh, is in place and has have developed in a low income country in Africa that uh, while well, global fund. Uh, the work has the, the system of build really has has really played a huge uh, important role in uh, pandemic uh, responses. So I think that uh, this is a way that uh, that uh, as a foundation that we will continue uh, work through our partnership with uh, uh, yeah at the, at the global level. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chen, Dr. Frieden. We do have a. Um, Another question that we probably can address before the final um, uh, remarks. Um, the question is about uh, COVID-19 in China, which taken to the uh, present sense. Um, the COVID-19 infected more than 80% US population uh, so far. And if this is the next step in China, uh, and I, I, I think actually there were some estimates about 60% or even more than that, in, in China, what should we do? Are we ready for that? I'm not sure if Dr. Gao or Dr. Gao. Yes, uh, I think that's a very good question. You got to be ready. Whether or not you are prepared, you got to be prepared. So, I mean, that's a absolutely question you have to say yes. First, I would say, we can learn from the rest of the world. You know, so many countries, they experienced, they have the lessons, they have experiences, we can learn. You know, with this zero COVID strategy, like I said earlier, we save the life, we save the time. Second, and we know we got to prevent the vulnerable population, like the elderly, old, uh, you know, uh, someone with uh, outlying diseases. So we have to do this so-called, you know, stratified strategy to organize the, you know, hospitals, all these resources. So that's very, very important. You know, we are doing very well. We are trying very hard to, you know, um, um, call for the young people, be they might, you know, if they are positive, they feel ill, I mean, don't rush to the clinic, you know, stay at home, you know, try because it's, uh, you know, all my course varies like, you know, uh, less 
pathogenic. And thirdly, so we have a very high popu population percentage of the vaccination. And also, you know, we have some therapeutics, uh, drugs or inhibitor ready like the uh, uh, Paxlovid, and also we have something also produced in China. So, you know, um, the only thing is, like I said, we try to do the um, uh, certify the vaccination for the elderly. And fourthly, so we are doing your, you know, a lot for the public understanding of size. So this is very important to prevent from the epidemic. You know, epidemic could be a very serious problem to anywhere in the world. Think about what happened this time, like Dr. Freddy mentioned, even President Trump said something, you know, it's, you know, it's so hard for the public to understand. And faithfully, for the pre you know, preparedness in China, I think we still have very strong government, you know, very, very strong political will here. So, you know, of course, you know, we, we, we are, you know, it's a very good, uh, it's a very big challenging issue in China, but, you know, we, we are, you know, we got to be ready. So that's my comment. I think that God might have something new. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Tao. That's really exciting. And Captain Bill? Well, uh, I only have something minor to, uh, <clears throat> to add to what uh, George just said. Yes, um, you know, um, you, you like or not, you have to meet the changes in, in the pandemic settings and, and, and the conditions. And, and then, and, and then uh, optimize your strategies accordingly. I think the difference is uh, you, um, you make the changes in your policy response more actively or passively. I think that's the difference that the people can you know, make um, assessment of that because the difference between passive versus active response would um would, would have different outcomes in terms of uh, uh, the health outcomes and economic outcomes. I think that's what I like to add to these points. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Liu. And I'm curious at the rest of the panel if I get to read and Dr. Coughlin, Dr. Chen, do you want to chime in? No, I would just I would just say that. Uh, China has followed a path to minimize the health harms from COVID. Uh, now, there, uh, there's a very challenging situation with a very highly infectious um, uh, variant that was not predictable. Uh, and with uh, increasing information that we have from all over the world that for the elderly, uh, vaccine protection wanes pretty quickly. Uh, within four to six weeks, four to six months, you can see uh, much um, much weaker protection from any of the vaccines. Uh, and you've seen what happened in uh, Hong Kong, where uh, there was a very rapid increase in mortality rate because you don't have the uh, existing immunity. So I think um, we should recognize that the situation is very challenging and uh, understand that the uh, society is doing what it can to balance. And this is one of the real challenges. How do you balance uh, the control of the disease with the ability to for kids to go to school, uh, to have economic progress, to have work? Uh, and this is something that every society needs to uh, determine for themselves. I can say that from the United States, we certainly made mistakes. We closed schools for too long, too soon, too many kids lost too much education. Uh, we uh, have not been able to vaccinate uh, seniors. In the US, we're still losing 200 people plus per day, uh, almost none of them up to date with their vaccination and getting Paxlovid if they're sick, but overwhelmingly the elderly. So I think we have to respect that each country has its own pathway and its own challenges, limitations, and strengths, uh, and that what China has done so far has prevented millions of deaths. Uh, and so what it does going forward is very challenging. And uh, we, we just uh, wish everyone well with that challenge. Thank you, Dr. Peter. 
Dr. Copeland and Dr. Chen. Yeah, thank you. I would fully concur with what Tom just said. One thing is that from really the start of my public health career, and I'm sure for the, our other panelists, something similar, the press likes to ask the question, well, are we prepared? And, um, and think that that's a reasonable question. I think it's, I've never heard anyone say, now that's a really good question, because it isn't. It involves weighing a variety of pieces of information, disparate pieces of information, and things change rapidly. And so it's guessing to some extent. Now we need to get hard evidence and replace guesses and uh, hypothesizing with data and studies. But nevertheless, that my answer for are we prepared is for what? Are we, is the, are we being prepared for an outbreak of 3,000 or an outbreak of 300 million. And, um, and the for what part is crucial. So when someone with great confidence says, oh yes, we're prepared, I would discount that information immediately. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for having us on. Thanks. Definitely. Do you have any comments on? Well, uh, well, next three months will be critical for China to cope uh, in terms of uh, tra transitioning. And uh, so personal uh, responsibility plus uh, government support is uh, critically important. I think that uh, uh, this is a critical moment and the need uh, uh, everyone really uh, be uh, alert and take action and uh, successfully uh, pass this uh, period of uh, transition. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. Thanks. Uh, um, uh, this is a great discussion, and I think we have a testimony of the pressing issues and also the long-term vision of uh, within the next 30 years for China and the US. Uh, I think we don't have enough time for additional questions. But uh, I was wondering, can uh, each of the panelists can provide uh, a one minute uh, uh, closing remark? Uh, can I start with uh, Dr. Frieden again? Thank you. Just very briefly, uh, we, we know even if COVID had never happened, we know that the world needs to do many things better. Reduce the risk of spillover from uh, whether it's wet markets or encroachment in forest areas in Africa or Asia or the Americas or wherever. We know we need better diagnostic systems to find problems when and where they first emerge. We know we need better laboratory systems to diagnose accurately and promptly and better biosecurity to make sure that uh, the laboratories that are worked in are safe wherever they are. We need better response systems, better vaccination programs. Uh, COVID is a wake-up call to the world. Even if it had never happened, uh, we know we must make rapid progress keeping the world safer because we are all connected and we should all be united in fighting our common enemy, which is a microbe, which is the microbial world, which outnumbers us. So we have to outsmart it by working together. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Kau? Yes. <clears throat> Three messages. First, Let's work together, not the microbes. Second, let's share for each other, not the pathogens. Third, let's invest more for surveillance and science. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Dr. Copeland. I'm going to stick with my friend, Dr. Gao. Those are the three things I would have said as well. So I'm all for it. Thanks. And Dr. Liu? Dr. Liu, you're muted. Yeah, well, we go through this difficult time with uh, many uh, external um, strikes, including both uh, the pandemic and the US-China complicated relationships. Uh, it is hard to predict what would happen by 2050, as we are supposed to talk about um, in, in today's uh, webinar, but but if we if we uh, look 
uh, back in, 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 in human history, I believe that uh, the past of uh, the world becoming more and more flat uh, in the last century would continue in my view. So I remain quite uh, optimistic and confident that the world will become more uh, united, more flat in the next 20, 30 years if I have to bet. I think that's, 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 that's the main driving force that, that um, other, um, the other uh, uh, the individual um, forces can, cannot win over the central trend of the development. Thanks, Jackson. That's exactly I want to, to, to say. I, I remain, remain optimistic. This world is uh, it's a beautiful, it's a life's beautiful. And I'm sure that uh, we will all work together really to make sure that uh, we are safe, health and uh, prosperity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks uh, Dr. Zhen, Dr. Liu, Dr. Copeland, Dr. Gao and Dr. Frieden for sharing your thoughts, sharing your vision of the future of public health in the US and in China and for the discussions and exchanges. This is uh, exciting, illuminating, and insightful. Now, many of the uh, recommendations, uh, things that are being discussed and will have important implications for public health uh, in US, in China, and worldwide. Uh, I wish I, we have more time to continue the discussion, uh, but unfortunately, we have to stop here. Uh, but I'm sure that we'll find another occasion to continue the uh, discussion and more importantly, to continue the uh, public health work. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we would like to conclude the last US-China 2050 webinar in 2022. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you uh, all at the next US-China 2050 uh, webinar in 2023, the new year. And please everyone do complete the uh, very short survey, which we all pop up in your uh, browser after the webinar to share your feedback. Uh, again, on behalf of the uh, Committee of 100 and the China Research Center, I want to thank the speakers and the participants uh, for your participation. Thank you for your time.